On April 28, 1908, an inferno consumed a farmhouse in Laporte, Indiana. Officials were distressed to find in the basement the bodies of three children and the remains of what was assumed to be the owner of the house, Bell, Soros, and Gunnis. But that was just the beginning of the grisly discoveries on the Gunnis farm. Within a few days, 11 more bodies had been discovered buried near the hog pits. Bell Gunnis, called by the press the Lady Bluebeard, the Laporte Ghoul, the mistress of murder farms, was accused of luring men to their deaths with promises of love and prosperity. And her own death has been a matter of speculation almost since the day it was announced, a fascination that says much about us. It is a grisly bit of American history that deserves to be remembered. The woman who had become Belle Gunnis was born in Norway on November 11, 1859. Her name was Brynhild Paulsdatter Storseth. She left the country of her birth behind when she was 21 to seek new opportunities in America. Brynhild adopted the name of Belle and married Norwegian immigrant Mads Dietlef Anton Sorensen in 1884. When the couple's house in Chicago burned to the ground, they used the insurance money to open a confectionery store. And when in what was supposed to be a string of very bad luck, the unprofitable confectionery store burned to the ground, they used the insurance money to purchase a house in a suburb of Chicago. According to the Laporte County Historical Society, the Sorensons were unable to have children together, so they supported a series of foster children whose names were Caroline, Axel, Myrtle, and Lucy. Other historians claim these children were Bell's own. The historical record is unclear on the truth of the matter. Foster children or biological, Carolyn and Axel died in the Sorensen's household. The cause of death for both officially was colitis, or an infection in the colon, but their symptoms could have been caused by poison rather than bacteria. Both children had life insurance policies, for which Bell Sorensen was the beneficiary. Mads Sorensen also had a life insurance policy listing Bell as the beneficiary. Bell claimed Sorensen's policy was too small to support the family if he perished, so the couple purchased a larger one. Mr. Sorensen died, coincidentally, on the day the two policies overlapped one another, bringing an estimated $5,000 to $8,500 through the combined policies to the grieving widow. When questioned about her husband's death, Bell said that he had come home with a headache and she'd given him a medicinal powder to help his headache, but when she checked on him later, he was dead. Two different doctors examined Mads Sorensen's body. The family doctor said the man had died of a cerebral hemorrhage, but again, the symptoms of Sorensen's death looked suspiciously like poisoning, which was the conclusion of the other doctor, but the family doctor's diagnosis was accepted by authorities because he had been treating Mads Sorensen prior to his untimely death. Perhaps to avoid the accusatory stares of her neighbors, who were having trouble believing this series of events, she used the money from her husband's life insurance policy to purchase a farm in Laporte, Indiana in 1901. Her remaining foster children, Myrtle and Lucy, went with her, as well as an adopted daughter named Jenny Olson. Bell met Peter Gunnis, a butcher, and married him soon after the move to Indiana. Gunnis had two children from a previous marriage, the youngest, only an infant, died shortly after Bell married her father. Eight months later, Gunnis also died. Bell claimed a sausage grinder fell from a high shelf and struck the unfortunate man on the back of the head. The coroner who examined Gunnis's corpse said he also showed symptoms of poisoning, though the death was officially determined to be accidental. Twice widowed and still supporting a series of foster children, Bell placed ads in Norwegian newspapers seeking a man to share her life on the farm with her. She wrote, Wanted. A woman who owns a beautifully located and valuable farm in first-class condition wants a good and reliable man as partner in the same. Some little cash is required for which will be furnished first-class security. It's unclear just how many men responded to Bell's ad, but the number is speculated to be between 14 and 40. Christian Hilkven, Ole Budsberg, John Moe, George Berry, and Emil Tell were all potential suitors who arrived at the Laporte, Indiana farm with thousands of dollars of cash in their pockets and were never heard from again. Bell hired a manual laborer named Ray Lampfear to help on the farm during her search for a husband. He would later claim that he and Bell had become lovers. He apparently had aspirations to become Bell's husband himself and became unhinged by the arrival of Andrew Helgeline of Aberdeen, South Dakota, one of Bell's final suitors. She had written to Helgeline for months, professing her love and desire for him to join his life with hers. She wrote, 
I long so to know you better, and I place you higher in my affections than anyone on earth. We shall be so happy when you once get here, and chillingly, come prepared to stay forever. She added, don't trust the banks, sell or mortgage the ranch and stock, and bring the money sewed in your clothes. Bell fired Lamphere, who didn't take his dismissal well. She told her neighbors that he had threatened her life, and after he continued to show up on her property, Lamphere was arrested for trespassing on the farm. He was later acquitted of the trespassing charges, but Bell continued to express her fear of her former farmhand. Meanwhile, she, by all appearances, was preparing to settle down with Helgeline. Helgeline and Bell were seen at a bank in town, where Helgeline cashed certificates for around $2,800, an amount that would equal approximately $78,000 today. Helgeline was prepared to settle for a check from the bank or leave some money in an account, but Bell demanded the entire amount in cash. It was the last time that anyone would see Helgeline alive. When Helgeline's brother, Osley, had not heard from his relative for some time, he found the letters from Bell and wrote to her, demanding to know his brother's whereabouts. She simply told him that Andrew had left. He didn't believe her and traveled to Indiana, seeking answers. In the book Hell's Princess, The Mystery of Bell Gunnis, Butcher of Men, author Harold Schechter notes that on April 27th, Bell's children had told some of their friends that she had beaten them when they went in the basement after she expressively told them not to. They had bruises that were proof of the truth of the story and evidence of their mother's temper. Around the same time, Bell visited her lawyer in order to update her will. She listed her children as beneficiaries for her estate, but curiously in the document, Bell didn't list her adopted daughter, Jenny Olson, who was assumed to be living in California. Also in late April, witnesses said Bell purchased a can of kerosene. The next day, her farmhouse burned. A woman's corpse and the bodies of three children were found in the basement of the home. Curiously, the body that was assumed to be Bell's corpse was missing its head. But false teeth located near the remains were positively identified by the family's dentist as belonging to Mrs. Gunnis. The authorities believed that Bell Gunnis had died in a tragic accident until Asla Helgeline arrived and asked that the farm be searched for his brother's body. Near the hog pens, investigators uncovered the dismembered remains of an estimated 11 people, including Andrew Helgeline. The coroner believed the deceased had been poisoned and then chopped into pieces. The press descended like flies upon the grisly scene, and curiosity seekers weren't far behind. An estimated 16,000 people per day visited the farm at the height of the media furor. The hotels were sold out in the towns nearby by the influx of visitors. The atmosphere was described as festive, with self-promoters selling food and drink to the tourists, as well as alleged photographs of the bodies that had been discovered. Some combed the farm for souvenirs, unknowingly destroying whatever evidence may still remain on the property. The public fascination wandered into the bazaar. A Dr. C.P. Bancroft of the Medico-Psychological Association speculated in a widely shared Associated Press article that Bell was doomed from birth to degenerate acts, a conclusion based on his observation that she had a peculiarly shaped head and a very large frame with small feet. One of the bodies was identified as 16-year-old Jenny Olson, the adopted girl who had moved to Laporte with Bell. Bell had told her neighbors that Jenny was now living in California and attending school, and had even said that she was planning to visit soon. Neighbors had worried about her after the fire, with one quote as saying, she'll be heartbroken. It turns out, she never left the farm. Disturbingly, most of the corpses discovered on the farm were in such terrible shape that identification was impossible. Since Bell was assumed to be deceased, authorities arrested Lamphere, the disgruntled farmhand, for arson and murder. The murder charges didn't stick, but the arson did, and Lamphere spent a year in prison before dying of tuberculosis. There's a supposed deathbed confession that has been attributed to Lamphere, wherein he admitted Bell poisoned her would-be suitors during dinner and then dismembered them afterwards. He also said that he had a part in finding the decoy body for Bell to place in the basement to fake her own death. However, the accuracy of this confession has been thrown into doubt because of the sensational nature of the case. The press were grasping at any and every lead to find the truth of the matter and may have concocted the confession to sell more papers. The real truth of what happened to Bell Gunnis' farm has remained lost to history. There has been some speculation that a woman named Esther Carlson, who died awaiting trial for murder in Los Angeles in 1931, might have been Bell Gunnis. 
She was accused by prosecutors of poisoning a man to steal his money, which was of course the modus operandi of Belle Gunness. She was about the right age if Belle Gunness had survived the fire, and she had some superficial physical resemblance to Belle Gunness, but a further analysis of the records in their past showed that it couldn't be the same person. In 2008 there was an attempt to scientifically answer the mysteries surrounding Belle Gunness, and the body that had been located in the farmhouse was exhumed, scientifically tested was determined to be the right height for Belle Gunness, but DNA analyses were inconclusive. Further attempts to test the DNA of saliva that she'd left on one of the envelopes that she'd mailed to one of her lovers also turned out to be inconclusive. The DNA was simply too degraded to make a comparison, and despite the best efforts of modern science, they were still unable to answer the mystery surrounding Belle Gunness. But of course part of the mystery of Belle Gunness is not just in the lurid details of her crime and the trial of her lover and the question of whether she died that day, it's a question of why we are so fascinated with people like Belle Gunness and are still fascinated by serial killers today. Dr. Scott A. Bond, who wrote a book on fascination with serial killers, summarized his ideas and findings in a 2017 issue of Psychology Today. He said, like it or not, from a sociological perspective, serial killers are one of us. They offer a safe outlet for our darkest ideas and feelings and urges that excite and tantalize us and they remind us that no matter our other flaws, the rest of us are, well, okay. Why are we fascinated with serial killers, Dr. Bond suggests? Because, surprisingly, we need them. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.